and welcome to the Help My Wealth podcast, Money Rules or Money Rules. Here at Help My Wealth, we are all about empowering financial success in our community of listeners. We hope you find today's topic both informative and helpful. Welcome back to the podcast, Money Rules or Money Rules. I'm your host, Stephen Logan, and today I have with me Matt Skeen. Matt, thank you for joining us. Not a problem, Steve. Matt is a financial planner, and you have been a financial planner for how long, I think? Been a financial planner for 21 years now. So just a short time. Yes. Fantastic. And our special guest today is Grant Hackett. Grant, thank you for coming. G'day, guys. Thanks very much for having me. No problems. I'm sure Grant doesn't need too much for an introduction, but... Grant is a legend of Australian sport. From the age of 16, he represented Australia. He won seven Olympic medals and was in, and won seven, 17 world championships. He was the captain of the Australian swimming team and was dubbed the king of the 1500 metres. After retiring from swimming in 2018, he, uh, 2008, he had to come back in 2015. He completed his executive masters of business administration with first class honours, a diploma in financial services of administration, uh, and a graduate from the Australian Institute of Company Directors. He was an ambassador of the Westpac Banking Corporation for 14 years and worked in many roles within that, over seven, and is the Chief Executive Officer of Generation Life. As you know, Help My Wealth is all about empowering your financial needs, and today we're gonna do that through talking to Grant. Grant, how has your week been? Very good, actually. I can't complain. Had had more wins than losses, so it's always a good thing. (laughs) That is always a good thing. And Matthew, you, have you had a good week? I have. I uh, had a good positive week and uh, I missed the Melbourne Cup, so no losses there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because I guarantee you probably would have one. Absolutely. So gold trip, who would have thought? Never even heard of that horse day before, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those days where some people are really happy and some people are really sad. Mm-hmm. It just depends on uh, on what you've done. And, and most feel really sad the next day, I believe, after the Melbourne Cup. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, Grant, it's been you know, great having you and, and thank you so much for coming on board and, and chatting to us. And um, I really want to get into Generation Life and, and talk about what you're doing there. Uh, yeah. Before we do that, I, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, you know, your past and, and where you've been, particularly yeah. around goal setting. So, you know, for someone like yourself, how old were you when you first decided, hey, I I'm going to do this. I want to be an Olympic champion. I want to win gold medals. I'm going to break world records. What age were you? Yeah, I mean, probably, I don't know if most Olympic um, gold medalists can answer this very specifically, but I know I can. I was 13 and I was very clear on my goal back then. And uh, the reason was, was because Sydney in 1993 got the Olympic Games, mm. the 2000 Olympic Games. And, you know, for me, I was I was a 200 metre backstroke. I ended up going over to the 1500 metre freestyle because I got in trouble a little bit with my coach. So he made me train with the distance athletes, with Daniel Kowalski and the like. And I, um, I really fell in love with the 1500 metre freestyle. So I, I literally sat down researched all of Kieran Perkins who was the number one guy in the sport at the moment. He was the Olympic champion, he was a world record holder, he was winning everything, he was an icon of Australian sport and I thought well what times did he do at 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 and then you're in the open category and that's how simple it was for me. I just thought well and what did he do in the other races too, the 200, 400, 800, 1500 meter freestyle and I literally put all of those times up on my wall for each of those age group categories and there was no Google back in 1993 so I was literally going through swimming old swimming magazines that my mum and dad had because my brother was his number one rival when they were younger so I uh, was able to find all of his times and yeah pin them up on the wall and go for him each year. Did your brother actually sit there and go I'm so glad you're going to beat him? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was probably nice for him. It was funny. They, they literally used to finish first and second at everything. I remember he actually beat my brother by a hundredth of a second of the state titles. My brother wow. went to nationals. My brother just got him there. So it was a really big rivalry. So I knew about Kieran from a, like literally from the age of seven about this guy who was a phenomenal athlete. And then, you know, he went on to do so many great things. He really went from what was a rival in our family to a hero of mine and yes. someone that was truly yes. inspirational all of a sudden back to rival, rivalry. So it was a really weird dynamic that I've, I've had with this guy and I'm, I'm literally catching up with him for lunch in a couple of weeks' time. So we ended up becoming friends, uh, which is good. It's all about timing, isn't it? <laughs> and you still so compete true. with your brother. Yeah, so- uh, yeah I mean, one, my, one of my initial goals was to beat his times yes. because, I mean, he, he, was a, he was a great athlete. He actually qualified for the Olympic team when he was 17 and yes. uh, didn't end up going for some political purposes but um, or reasons. But, yeah, it, it, was, it was, you know, stepping stones along the way and when you hit those milestones it just motivates you to get to the next one 
Absolutely. And look, one of the things I have always found interesting when we talk about you and, and actually setting those goals is, I mean, when you were 13, how, how far ahead was Kieran Perkins compared to you at that age? Like what was the distance? Was it, was it 10 seconds, 30 seconds? I mean, you know, one minute, what was the difference? Yeah, it was, it was funny. I, I remember, you know, specifically the 14-year-old one. So I was swimming a time of 16 minutes 46. His world record at that time was 14 minutes 41. So of a 30-lap race, I was over four laps behind. So yeah. I was a very, very long way behind. So it's it's literally not even being a base camp of Mount Everest. It's it's literally being, you know, at sea level basically and going, <laughs> okay, there's a long, long way to go here. And you've just it is, it's a game of inches, right? Like you just got to take a little bit more ground, a little bit more ground and and slowly but surely you, you end up, you know, getting through all these big barriers. And and it was probably an important point that I didn't call out too much before, just answering that initial question that you had, Stephen. But what's really important is once you reach one goal, it gives you the motivation and confidence to get yes. to the next one. That's why it's important to have goals that are stepping stones rather than go, okay, I've got my big goal. That one feels completely insurmountable right now. Not really motivated because I'm not going to get there in the next couple of months, but I need my smaller digestible goals just to be able to tick off and go, okay, got that one. Next one, right, let's get after it. And look, I think that's what I what I love about it. I mean, you know, here's this uh, 13, 14-year-old. He's got a, a four-lap, um, you know, gap that he's got to make up, however many minutes that is. And for most people, that would be insurmountable. They'd give up. I know. I know. I would have given up at thirteen or fourteen. Reject. I'm out. That's, it. That's, that's right. But you know, here you are. You, you broke it down into into you know what was he doing at thirteen? What was he doing at fourteen? What was he doing at fifteen? If I can hit those goals, do you know, if I can hit those goals, then then when I'm at seventeen, I can be where he's at. And I think yeah. that's the really important thing about goals, like you said. You know, um, and then and then take those wins. I'm pretty sure you uh, you know when you when you hit the Kieran Perkins 14 year old goal, you didn't go, yeah. Oh, it's not his current one. You would have been yeah. excited, yeah. you would have been like, Yes, oh, I'm pumped. celebrating that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the biggest milestones was when I was 15, actually, because when I was 15, he went a time. I remember all the times I'm very much a student of the sport because you know, I'm very specific, as you can tell. And no yes. one told me to do go and do goal setting, I didn't even know what that was. It was just a logical, <laughs> naive process that I followed as a 13 year old, but. It was when I was 15, the national record was actually a time of 15 minutes 31, which was Stephen Holland's um, record at the time. And it was held for close to 20 or 30 years and was actually the world record as a t- at the time. He did it as a 15-year-old. Wow. And right. Kieran went 15 minutes 39, so he didn't even quite go as quick as Stephen. And I remember going 15 minutes 30 at the Olympic trials in 1996, and it was the best feeling ever because I'd just gone past these two legends at this age, and it, and it really springboarded me into as a 16 year old to make my first national team and and that to him to me those those goals are big big motivators mm. and they're, they're a sense of confidence that yes i can do this so yeah. I've, I've been able to beat this and even if you get close it still felt just as good i was three seconds off kieran's time as a 16 year old but i thought i'm, I'm right there still i'm right there yeah. i love that you've said that you know when you've got a big goal to achieve like i want to win the gold medal at the olympics you break that down into small pieces because until you you know achieve that goal you haven't succeeded yeah but you've got to achieve those milestones in between to actually make yourself feel like you're actually getting somewhere uh, absolutely and and you've got to celebrate them too it, yeah. it was something that i wasn't great at to, to be totally frank but you've got to have little rewards along the way just to go you know and even when you know we're sitting here pr- talking about finances in a second but it's like when you know you hit a certain milestone you can go out and buy that thing but don't go out and buy it straight away and it's so much more rewarding when you have discipline around things yes. I, I remember saving i saved for a pair of oakley sunglasses when i was 10 <laughs> years old for nine months nine months i was saving lunch money no problem. Dad even said, oh, we won't go to the Gold Coast show. Can I give you $50 for it? And I was like, I'm not going to the show. And the show was the best thing ever. I didn't realize that that would have been a lot more valuable for him, the 50 bucks. Like probably I could have got 150 bucks out of him, I think. But, you know, it's, it's funny, this instant gratification – isn't actually a good feeling for the soul. So it's funny when you have these these big goals and these milestones and you've got the discipline around them and you achieve them, there, there's not a better feeling in the world. Uh, that's my perspective anyway. Mm. I don't know. I, I think Oakley sunglasses would have been a pretty good a pretty good <laughs> yeah, reward well. I thought it was very cool once I got them, don't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people know the mirror, mirror coloured mirrored ones. <laughs> they were the old, I think they were called the like the Mambo ones. They yes. were sort of, you know, like a lot of the triathletes wear. Oh, they were yeah. like 1990. They were like the, the it thing. So, and 
and um, and it was funny. I, I remember my brother getting a pair, and I thought I wanted a pair so badly. And I was like, I spent literally nine months saving on top the top of my drawer, my bedside table. All my money was just going in there, and you know, eventually got there. And it was the most satisfying feeling when I got to buy them. But I always think back to those things when I was younger because they they taught me so many good yes. lessons. Like yeah. even even when I shifted from you know sport into business, yeah. I didn't go into the mindset. Oh, you know, I'm kind of the global CEO of what I'm doing here in swimming, you know, I've won for over a decade and achieved everything you, you could basically in the sport. But at the same time, I wasn't thinking about when I was at my best there, I was thinking about what was I doing through these periods when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, and what was that hunger? What was that desire like? What was the life when people would not thinking that you couldn't reach those goals? And so I got actually back into that mindset when I was in business because I knew I was literally going from being the best in the world at something to going into Collins Street at Westpac on a Monday morning, not being the best at the table. <laughs> so, right. you know, as soon as I recognized that, I could get on with with doing the job and getting to somewhere where I felt a real sense of achievement. Yeah. And look, you know, talking about your dad with, uh, you know, helping you, helping you save, I wanted to ask a question. I, I heard that he actually said to you, look, you know, Grant, you need to retire to something. Is that that's a true statement? He said that to you? Yeah, absolutely. He said as an athlete, you can't retire from you know, yes. the sport, you got to retire to something. Oh, and yeah. I've never forgotten those, those words. And it was always important that, you know, I did well at school, you know, as soon as I finished school to, to get into university, but it wasn't done in a way where people might think, because people see elite athletes. And I know this is true in a lot of cases, but it wasn't like I was sitting there being pushed, being told you have to do this or yes. achieve this. It was like, no, you have to do this because there's a really good reason why. Yeah. And I, I got that reason and engaged with it and, and thought, yeah, okay, get into uni and then training for the Olympics. Let's do for uni for a little while, then go back and do one or two subjects. And, you know, it was important to be a, a, a well-rounded person. As much as sport, you do live in a, a bubble. It was still really important from my parents' point of view that there was more to life than that. And regardless, financial success did not matter. It was about having a sense of purpose post-sport, which was which is really important. And I'm really grateful for that now. And, you know, I see a lot of even, you know, athletes that I know or have been friends with don't necessarily have made that transition terribly well or have stuck their teeth into to something that's quite different. So how often were you, uh, you know, studying compared to those around you when, you know, you had this goal of I'm going to win the Olympics, but I'm also at some point going to go and do uni? Yeah, it was funny. I was, I was studying commerce law at the time um, at university. And, yeah, I'd literally be sitting on a plane traveling from, you know, Seoul over to, you know, somewhere in Japan and then doing a World Cup in Singapore or whatever it might have been. And I was sitting on a plane with a textbook going through stuff, you know, emailing or reaching out to, to my lecturers. So, yeah, it was pretty consistent. It was really funny. Every time I was doing one or two subjects, I would actually swim better. Uh, but I, I just believe because I just didn't have all my eggs in one basket. Like, yeah. actually, the friends in a different area I had you know things going on in my mind that weren't just so goal orientated and focused because you know you can be too absorbed in something and it yeah, can totally. consume you and, and sport totally does that particularly when people know you're you know associated with that sport which still happens obviously today for me so having that outside sort of I guess friend group and goal and, and you know a different set of sort of things that I was trying to achieve in was really really healthy and I actually think it reflected positively in my perf performance so you can actually relax a little bit yeah, it, it, it's just weird because I think your nervous system isn't so wound up. Like yeah. you're not sitting at bed at night going, oh, okay, what have I got to do training? You know, what have I got to do with this competition coming up? You're actually sitting there doing a marketing subject, trying to think of an idea. Your, your mind's actually focused elsewhere. And I think that's giving somewhat of a, a stress release to, to sport, which was probably underestimated, um, but upon reflection was was completely healthy. Yeah. So I have to ask you, I don't know about you, Matthew, but, uh, you know, my 13, 14, 10 year old self was not getting up early in the morning and, and going swimming. I, I've, I've shared once before, I did actually do, do swimming training, Grant. Um, maybe not at your level, you know, but, uh, you know, t one, one to two afternoons a week, I'd be, I'd be in the pool. I, you know, yeah. I, I make to state. That's where I, that's where I capped that's out. That's pretty good. That's so pretty I, good. I, I was happy. I did recognize that when I got to state that I was way outside my, my league. Uh, prior yeah. to that, I thought. State, yeah. state does work out. The, the men from the boys, so to speak, once you get there and then nationals is the next sort of step yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I recognise that my uh, two afternoons a week we're not going to cut it. But, you know. <laughs> and the floaties didn't work either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The yeah. floaties weren't helping. Yeah, they, they weren't cool anymore. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus, I, you know, I did have a coach. I, I've mentioned before that uh, if you weren't swimming fast enough, you had a, um, a bucket of uh, goggles that he would flick you. So you'd be yeah. swimming along and you, you'd feel a, a goggle in your back and you think to yourself, I'm, I'm not going fast enough there. I probably need 
need to, you know, power yeah. up a little bit. Yeah, I've got three goggles on my back. I'm really not going fast yeah. enough now. <laughs> <laughs> but on that, I mean, you know, here I am at 13 and I'm sure you were too, Matt, sleeping in, having fun. What, what were you doing in the morning? What, what motivated you to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning at 14 years old and go, before school, I'm going to go and swim a couple of kilometres? Yeah, it's it's funny. It really is going back to those goals. Like I just had really clear goals. And I think once you have clarity over your goals um, and you're willing to, to go through the process to achieve those, it kind of everything else falls into place. It's like, well, if I do realistically want to achieve that, I know I have to do ABC. Yeah. And for me, that was getting up at quarter to five, you know, probably at the age of 13, I was doing eight sessions a week. So I was probably doing at least, yeah, three mornings, yeah, five afternoons. That's right. So I'd probably wow. do a Monday a Wednesday, a Saturday morning, and then all the afternoon straight after school. So it was it was serious stuff. But at the same time, I had a great group of friends down at the swimming pool. So I had a yeah. real social network down there. So I really enjoyed just hanging out with them, competing against them. And and funnily enough, through through those years, a lot of my friends um, in the sport became some of my best buddies that I still talk to today. And, you know, we'd train and then, you know, you'd go down to Sizzler or Pizza Hut afterwards <laughs> and, you know, you, you could eat half the place in the buffet because you were so hungry for training and never, never put on a gram of weight <laughs> because you're doing all this training and, and your metabolism metal- metabolism is super quick. So for me, as much as the training was hard and a lot of discipline, there was a lot of fun around it as well. And and I think, you know, that to me just made it more sustainable. And this is what I always say to people when they talk about high performance, there's almost this perception that everything has to be serious. They have to be focused, you know, committed, all these kind of hard nosed words. And I go, yeah, it's, it is all of those things. And when you're in the moment, it has to be all of those things. But guess what? You can have a laugh. You can have a joke. You can be light. Take it seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. And and I think that lightness is a really important part of success because it's performance and enjoyment at the same time. And that combination gets the best outcomes in, in my view. Right. So obviously, um, you know, when people are working through goals and, you know, motivation is probably the hardest thing for them to, you know, get for themselves. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, you've had very early mornings um, that most people yeah. generally wouldn't. How did you get yourself through those days where you think, oh, do I really want to get out of bed today? <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because that was the one thing. I mean, I didn't mind training hard and pushing myself and going through all that hurt that you needed to to achieve in the sport, but I hated 4.45 a.m. wake-ups. <laughs> like, it killed me. I am not a morning person. So when that alarm would go off, you know, I, firstly, I played little tricks on myself. I, I would put the alarm, like, over on the other side of the room so I had to get <laughs> out of bed to go and turn it off. You know, you've got to do all these little things where you know you've got you know weaknesses um the other one that i would really do and deploy on particularly days like that when i found it quite challenging and tough and don't get me wrong i don't have any less challenging days than anybody else like mine are exactly the same but what i would do is just focus on the next step yeah um because i feel like you know when you know you're going to get up do an eight kilometer session fog your guts out that you know you're probably going to go oh mate i've got a bit of a headache and a sore throat i think i might go back to bed the rest is in my best interest (laughs) today so um but but i would go okay just get up, go have something to eat, then go down to the pool, just do your scratching, see your feel. Then once the scratching's over, get changed, get in the water, do the warm-up. It was just like just take the next That's step. And, and eventually that would get your motivation going, I felt. So I feel like, you know, we often have this concept in our minds where motivation is the thing that has to happen first, yeah. then we start doing. Yeah. It's actually, to me, it's the complete opposite. It's the doing and then the motivation starts to kick in as you do more, and that's yeah. kind of where you build from there. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And look, it's it's funny. It's it's uh, you know you talk about goal setting and goals, and and people that have achieved great things will will often come back and say exactly what you've said. Take a good big goal, break it down, take that broken down goal, and go right. Yeah, what is it? Get up at four forty five. Just turn yeah. up at the pool, start yeah. stretching, you know, break that down. And yeah. um, it seems really easy. It does. It does, doesn't it? You know, but, but it's, it's actually <laughs> You can doing sit here and say it in a few words. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the thing. Right. The, the right. behavioural aspect's a little bit more challenging. That's right. And it's doing it day after day after day, time after time after yeah. time. That's what actually makes it hard, isn't it, Do you know? And, and and that's everything. Everyone goes to me, you know, it must be monotonous going up and down that black line. I'm like, yeah, but 
any success is monotonous. It's yes. actually just like to, to your point, Stephen, it's it's every day just doing these little things that just slowly add up as plus ones. I mean, yeah. could you imagine being a cricketer? How many cricket yeah. balls do you have to hit? How many do you yeah. have to bowl standing yeah. out in the field, being a tennis player? How many times you got to hit a, yeah. any success in business, sitting there going through the sales process? How many rejections do I got to have before I get a sale, That's before right. I get my pitch yeah. right? Like all these, you know, people that we see and put up on, you know, I guess pedestals that have been successful in different fields in life. It was just boring grind every single day that refine their skill, just become a little bit better and, and not giving up on that. It's, it's as soon as you get to the day where you go, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's too boring. It's like you'll never be successful if you think that because it's the boring stuff that actually counts towards the bigger goals. Yeah. yeah. So obviously that goal setting has been really important for you in the professional <laughs> sense, but how has that led to you in you know your, your business career now? Really simple, actually. Like not not at the start, if I'm being completely transparent about it. But now it's actually really simple to cross over in terms of the principles and behaviours of success. So, um, you know, I've got three very core sort of elements to to success that I've brought from the pool into the business environment and to to running, you know, generation life and generation development group, you know, I have three things. I have a clear definition of success and failure, not too many performance metrics. I have what is it that, what is it that you're here for? What's yeah. the purpose? What's driving you? So and I'm very clear on my purpose, but everyone has an individual one. And then third part is the commitment. And yeah. the commitment is, you know, sport, it's the training, it's getting up a quarter to five. What's the commitment here? What are the disciplines in your diary that you need to have in order to be successful day in, week in, week out sort of thing? So, um, and we actually put that all through our strategy pack. You'll see every single business unit here has a clear definition of what success looks like, what failure looks like, and what we're trying to achieve as a business. We've got a very clear three-year vision that we have in place. So yeah. everything has clarity around it. So that's the one thing from sport. It's really easy to turn around and go, I succeeded or I failed. You know, it's a, it's a time, it's a place. Like it's in business, it can be very grey, right? Like you know, things are going good in financial markets. We all look like superstars, yeah. but you know, when when things turn bad, that's when you know things come to the surface a little bit more, and and the, and the tide comes out. So, I think um, from that point of view, I've been able to transfer a lot of those disciplines into the business, and I I've also tried I try to bring that lightness too. I try to have fun with the team. I try and make sure that we're connected, we're bonded, we have a strong culture of having one another's backs that's what I always felt like when I was on the um, national swim team that you know when I was you know I would look when I was going out for a relay and I saw Ian Thorpe on my right Michael Clem on my left I thought how are you going to beat us from the US here you know I just total trust in my team members and so that trust element people having your back knowing they can perform and step up when you need to is really important so developing the right team and right culture around that's really important these are all simple things to say um, but I've just found the the principles of any sort of success in any field are exactly the same and I've just kind of over the years tried to refine well what I didn't do in the pool to actually achieve I guess the top of the Olympics How, how can I try and bring some of those things into to business and you know it's been um it wasn't easy at first but over time you sort of learnt how that sort of worked and how you could actually directly and, and have those parallels to come into business and and it and it has driven good outcomes so you know must must work to some extent yeah i mean look, obviously being a top tier athlete in the world you know coach and and mentors was was important to you and that's something that you just expect do you know what i mean no one sees someone with an olympic medal and think to themselves they did it without a coach you know, it's, it's yeah. almost it's almost just expected. But how's that experience, uh, you know, from that sort of world, you know, when it comes to coaching and mentoring, actually impacted your your work now as a financial advisor and actually working in the finance industry? It's it's so funny because I mean, people look at um, successful. Um, you know, uh, individuals in any field, yeah. and they've all got a coach. They've all had someone who mentored. They all had someone they looked up to. Yeah. And it's really funny if you're sitting in the chair and you don't have that, you're probably in a bit of trouble. Yeah. Not in terms of like you can't do your job or you're not going to get some sort of success, but it's probably going to be relatively mediocre. That's yeah. that's a reality, because all these great people had someone to aspire to. I mean, I actually just watched that movie, you know, King Richard the other day, um, and you know, on the the Williams sisters. And, and you just see that they 
had him there the whole time, just setting the tone, setting the goals, and and they bought into it, right? So the individual's always got to buy into the, the the coach mentor relationship. But it doesn't matter whether you're doing anything from managing money through to trying to achieve in sports or trying to you know set up a new business. You actually need someone there to bounce ideas off. Someone who's going to call you out on your own BS because we all have that. Totally. Someone who's going to keep you accountable. Yeah. Someone who's trodden the path before that you're willing to listen to. You respect enough to have that relationship with. So, you know, if if you don't have that in certain areas of your life that you're trying to be successful in, you, you're going to succeed nowhere where you potentially could. Yeah. So you, you've had some time in, in Westpac and I started my um, financial planning career in Westpac as well and uh, under the guise of Gail Kelly, um, you know, yep. a fairly dynamic person, four kids to look after, running you know, <laughs> top four Triplets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's a hard gig, you know, all the hours and those type of things. But it must have been really yeah. good to have you know, someone with, you know, that dynamic mentorship behind you. How did that help you? Yeah, I've been really fortunate. I guess that's one of the things of having that professional sport background. I've had access to people that you wouldn't normally have yeah. access to. And, and, you know, I've been so grateful to, to receive that. So when I sat down, I was looking at my finance career, I, I sat down with um, Rob Coombe, the CEO of BT, um, the CEO of the Americas, I think he was at the time, the Macquarie Bank. Tim Bishop had lunch with them, got some guidance from them. Um, my job interview at Westpac was with both Rob and, and Gail Kelly, who are the two, you know, CEOs of both the, the BT and the Westpac side. So it was it was really fortunate that I had this exposure to these people. Um, and just in terms of the way they operate, like I, I've learned so much in their approach towards uh, people management strategy towards, you know, how to take the right calculated risks um, in business, how to build the right team um, and how to create a great operating rhythm of success around that, around your day-to-day processes. So, you know, having those sorts of mentors in life and, and I'm a person who always asks questions. So if I meet someone successful, I'm, I'm pretty annoying because I'm like, oh, how did you do it? Oh, yeah. What did you do? Yeah. Okay, what's that? And, and I'm really quite direct. Like I will <laughs> ask like questions and my mum says, you're lucky you're in the position you are because no one can ask those sort of direct questions. So she thinks <laughs> <laughs> probably being slightly intrusive, but um, but I can't help myself because I'm, I'm so like intrigued by their success and so curious about how they achieved it, what they went through as well, like what's their story. And and then I, I always try and find the pieces of gold in those conversations yeah. and then just bring, bring something back to myself that I can utilize. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And like, you know, uh, you took on that role at one point of being the um, captain of the um, of the swimming team. I mean, how did that affect you? That I assume that was the first time you were put into that coaching mentoring type role officially. Yeah, yeah. So I was, was kind of doing that that role within the team because I'd spent a number of years there and had quite a bit of success. So I was always trying because I always enjoyed trying to help other athletes out. And they, they formalized that um, in 2005 and, and made me team captain. And my coach was actually quite concerned at the time because you could imagine being a, a person who competes in, you know, kind of five to six races over the course of a week with heat, semifinals, finals, being endurance, having all these other athletes around you that you're trying to support through that process and, and coming into that process around the preparation um, can distract from your own performance and be potentially detrimental. And he he was worried about it. He knew I wanted to do it, so he let me do it, but he thought it might be an issue. And it's, it was really funny that year I actually got world swimmer of the year. I actually beat Michael Phelps for that title. So I had a phenomenal world championships, broke one of um, Ian Thorpe's records. And, you know, and, and the funniest thing kind of happened as part of that dynamic or shift. I found, you know, one, I was putting effort and energy into other people and trying to help and support them where I could um, and support the team more broadly and represent the team well. But it kind of came back tenfold, which I didn't expect. Like they supported me a lot more as well. Yeah. Like they had my back and I, and I I felt that that energy as well. So I think, you know, you, you kind of underestimate as soon as, because I, I think a lot of people, particularly when you see in the corporate world, and I've noticed this a lot at big institutions and feedback, and you guys would have heard this as well. People are basically trying to step on people's heads to get up to the, mm. you know, top of the corporate ladder. Um, if you take the view that if you help other people, they'll actually put you on their hands and push you up even further. Yeah. And that's what I found through that captain experience. And it actually helped with my own personal performance and, yeah, and I, and I think it probably brought me a lot closer to, to my teammates as well. So I was very fortunate to have that support back. And I think, like, you know, saying that, I mean, that's, that's, there's two important things there. One, you were already doing the job before you were given it. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and so it wasn't like they're like, oh, I wonder if you can do this job. They actually saw that you were doing the job and then went, mm. we should make this official. And yeah. look, you know, the second thing is 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 um, at Help My Wealth, we're, we're really about having a mentor and having someone mm. walk alongside you because, you know, we've been out there trying to do our own financial world our own financial life for years and it hasn't worked and it's not because you're hopeless it's not because you're not dedicated it's not because you don't want to you know get debt under control or increase your savings but having that extra person having someone that you're accountable to that you've actually Mm. given permission and say to them "Um, I want you to keep me accountable Mm. do you know what I mean I want to save $50,000 by this time Mm. because I want to head towards getting a house deposit yep have that person come back and go you know you're at eight Mm. you should be at ten by now do you know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, you know, we're just gonna, we've just, you've done well, but we've just got to pick yeah. that a little bit further. Mm. Like, it's yeah. really important, isn't it? You know, it's, oh, it, it's, it's so important. <laughs> It's hugely important. And like a good example of that is when when you say to a buddy, hey, let's go to the gym tomorrow morning. I'll, yes. I'll meet you at 6 a.m. You generally do get up and you meet mm. them there because you're kept accountable to the other individual. Yep. If you thought, I'm just going to get up and do it on my own, you're like, oh, geez, I'm a little bit tired. I tell you what, Game of Thrones was a little bit too good last night. I watched three episodes, so which we've all done. So, you know, but if someone's keeping you accountable, generally you'll meet the goal easier easier as well. Yeah. Um, the other aspect to that too, when we're talking about our finances, like I'm a big believer in, in financial planning and financial support yes. because, you know, if you've got a legal issue, you go to a lawyer. If you've got to do your tax return, you go to an accountant. Um, you know, if your car's broken down, you go to a mechanic. You don't try and do any of those things yourself, but it's quite remarkable. Most people, to some extent, are pretty financial literate. Like they don't understand deductible debt, non-deductible debt, the right structures to be investing through, make sure they're maximizing their super and you know, the stuff they've got outside of super. What are they? doing with place of residence how can they accelerate paying that down credit card debt you know what's what does that mean versus getting the debt from over here like all these nuances like financial services and finance is so complex and fraught with so many landmines you've got to be super careful um but we often enough try and do it all ourselves and yeah. we don't get someone to actually help us so yeah. i think it's um it's one of those professions that's really underestimated in terms of the impact it can make to you, your financial well-being yeah yeah i think we've said it before about um it's almost good better best Mm. Uh, you know, from, from my background being a, uh, you know, property investment advisor, um, the average person that they live in a house, they've seen houses, they can go and buy a house mm. yeah. and they can do a good job, yep. you know, yep. and 10 years time they can go, oh, it's a good job. Mm. It's mm. increased in value. I've got good rent yeah. for it. I'm, I'm happy. Yep. But the question comes down to at that time, 10 years ago, was there a better choice? Mm. It's mm. not about you being incompetent. Do you know oh, what I mean? No. I, I could do my tax. I'm just not going to do it as well. <laughs> you're not going to get the return that I'm you're used to. I'm not going to get like. the return as an accountant's going to give me. I'm going to miss stuff. I'm going to yeah. miss stuff. Yeah. And, and I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That's, you know, when we talk about coaching, mentoring, that's what we're talking about. We're not saying, mm. hey, you know, you as a swimmer couldn't get in the water mm. and actually do well. But yeah. could you be an Olympic champion mm. without yeah. a coach and a mentor? Yeah, you know Exactly. Yeah, and it's not going to happen. That's right. From a financial point of view, could you do well financially? Sure. Mm. But if you had mm. someone to help you, could you do better? Could you do better? Mm. And I think mm. the problem we have is, is that in our world, in the financial world, there's there's a cost involved in that, and, and particularly with the with the whole royal commission. You know, you guys have gone through a big thing in the financial planning industry. We have gone. Oh, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to. If someone comes along and they really can't afford much, well, you can help them out a little bit, mm. but you can't do that mm. anymore. No. You know, the government mm. has turned around and said, right, no. You know, you have to actually charge for a service. It's got to be at this level. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it at this level, you're in trouble. And so all of a sudden now there's people where you're going, I really want to help you, but I've got to charge you this level to to help you. And that's where Help My Wealth is coming in and going, well, hang on a second. Financial planners are great. You know, there's there's a lot you can do for someone, but there is this area where we're saying to people, right, you know, how can we help you to get to the first step? You know, how can we help you get to the second step? How can we, and then from there, you can go on to financial planners and, and whatever else you need from then on, you know, which is really yeah. important. Yeah. Exactly. It's a matter of going, well, how do I get to first base, second yes. base? You know, I'm not trying to hit a home run straight away, but I need I need a little bit of guidance. I need a little bit of help. And and it's often funny when you run through people's finances, all the leakage, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you just stop at that cup of coffee or stop expending over here or maybe did this a little bit differently or maybe ate it 
eat at home maybe two more times, you know, during the month or, you know, they're, they're little behaviors. If someone's actually giving you a little bit of guidance and a little bit of direction around, you will change because they're going to keep you accountable around it as well. And and I think those little, this is what we're talking about, right? Like I was over four laps behind. It's the plus one, plus one that all of a sudden, wow, I'm actually in a position now where I can compete for a world record or I can compete and go and do things that, you know, five years ago were, were completely unattainable or a complete dream. Almost if you told someone you'd feel deluded so you know but but it's the same with you know saving for a deposit on a house or you know your superannuation it's you know making sure you pay off that that house three or four years earlier by just doing things a little bit better and saving yourself x amount of interest there's so many little things that you can do that are going to make big differences over time it's like the compounding effect right yeah i think matt you've said it before one of your favorite things is to do it today yes you know what i mean like what's 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 the quote about the decision best time to make a decision is Today. It's today. And the second best time is tomorrow. Sorry, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday, today, yeah. <laughs> and, like, you know, it's it's one of those things where uh, I talk to a lot of people and they go, oh, I agree. I need to do that. Yep. I need to get a mentor. I need to get a coach. I need to start putting a little bit of money away to, mm. you know, to be able to build up my funding. I need to get my deposit. But I'll do it later. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll do it later. And that's the hard <laughs> thing, isn't it? And it's almost people think uh, with this perfectionist mindset, like if I'm going to do it, I have to do it like this and everything has to be lined up. Everything has to be perfect. I have to be making this much money in my job. And it's like, no, you know, you don't have to be saving, you know, $300 a week or $500 a week. You can be saving 50 bucks a week, you know, and and it'll add up. And if you're investing, you're putting in a structure that gives you a little bit of discipline. It's amazing what that will accrue to over time. And if you're in a half decent investment, how that will grow with it. So, you know, it's, it's only little steps that eventually turn into, to, to much, much bigger steps that actually get you to a place where you start to feel really happy and pleased. And like I said, build that confidence and momentum in what you're doing. And certainly with your finances, um, that's absolutely paramount to, to do that. And to, to your point, Steve and, and, and Matt, it's it's do it. Today. Don't wait. Don't wait to the perfect time. Don't keep procrastinating around it. Yeah. Actually, take some action. Put a plan in place and start to execute around and get some su- support as well. Yeah, there's so many people that I see. You know, they they say they want to wait until they're in a better financial position before they go and buy a house or have kids mm. or whatever. And that really astounds me a lot. And it goes back to your point before where you said, "I'd rather start doing," and then the motivation comes mm. from yeah. seeing the success come out of that. Mm. And, it, and it's quite amazing when you actually start doing how your fears are overcome because yeah. a lot of the time it's all locked up between the years, right? Like yeah. we start to manifest, you know, and future trip and things start to, you know, we're going to take that, – that could take place or potentially take place or go wrong as part of that process. So, therefore, it actually stops us engaging. But as soon as you start doing, you actually remove the anxiety quite a bit and you actually start to build motivation and you start to see success, which again builds that confidence. So, yeah. I think it's really, really important important um almost like lesson or attribute that you've got to really engage with is to go i've got to just start doing doesn't matter how doesn't matter who sometimes i've just got to start doing and get stuck into it yeah totally and i look you know if you go back to the swimming thing for you because you, you know who was doing it that day but michael phelps was doing it that day you know <laughs> yeah, who you thought was doing right. it that day like there's other people out there that were doing it that day for you you know yeah, co- correct. Um, it's it's one of those things where if I don't get up and do that session, if I don't work my backside off and, and yeah. you know, try and get the times and push my body through, you know, that sort of next threshold of pain, I know that a person up in China is doing it or, you know, over in the UK or in the US and, and some of these great athletes that you just touched on. So, you know, you've you've competition is healthy as well. Like sometimes I think, you know, people often see competition as um, something that, you know, is, somewhat of a distraction or can be unhealthy. And I actually think the right sort of competition is really healthy because one, it shows you what can be done. Yeah. Two, it just keeps you on song and keeps you motivated. It's when you distract yourself 100% of the time with the competition, that's when it's actually unhealthy. But yeah. to have a bit of competition and, and focus like that is really important because it does uh, instill better behaviours in your day-to-day practices. I mean, for you, there was a time where you actually moved to the States and actually, um, you know, spent a lot of time with, with Phelps, didn't you? Mm. 
I did, I did. And funny enough, I'm just looking at my phone. He's actually just WhatsApp me a couple of times. We <laughs> we often still do training together. Talking. We, we just did, yeah, we just did Squattober. So we send each other videos of us doing squats and, <laughs> you know, trying to do more and more weight and still pushing one another. So still, that, that competitive element's still there. But, you know, it's, it's really funny when you see, I guess, the next level of mindset. I always thought I had a, a big goal setting mind. And I thought, you know, I want to win Olympic gold medal and I want to do it in this yeah. race and do it in this time in front of a home crowd, you know, some pretty, pretty big goals. And then I go over and see Michael and he's kind of thinking, I want to go to one Olympics and win eight gold medals. And it's like, <laughs> really? Are you thinking this thing? Yeah. There is a thing called competition in a lot of those races. And it's amazing. Like that's where his mindset went to. He just set the bar so high, but he was willing to do the work around it. And he just had a strong sense of self-belief that he could do it. Yeah. And he's got this mo- the most unbelievable competitive mindset. Um, I often say that Michael um, and Ian Thorpe are two of the people that I can never poke the bear on because it's funny. You get these people that are just, when, when they get to competition, they're able to increase their performance through yes, that. Yes. Most other people get a little bit rattled or a bit worried or it distracts them. Those guys, it just intensifies their performance. So I, I never, I do it now. I'll probably do it in my next text message back to them because it's not real competition. But uh, but it's it's funny. Like the only reason we came up with Squat Tober was because I was giving him crap about, oh, uh, you know, when I come to your house, because I was just in the US recently and I, I popped by his house and stayed for a couple of days where I said, oh, I'll out squat you. And, he, and then he created Squat Tober. Like again, just a guy just has to take it to the, the, the next level all the time. And now I'm back here in Australia sending, you know, videos of myself doing squats at home. So it's just, it's it's a bit bizarre, but it's, it's fascinating to be around those sorts of people because you see their mindset and sense of self-belief and mm. an ability to be able to commit is just, it's, it's, it's awesome and it's truly inspiring. I would love to see the look on yours and his face as you email him a silver medal for Scott Tober. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> just, it's, it's just funny. What, 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 one of the things that we do do, and I've got the photos of my phone, is uh, there was a 4 by 2 race in Athens 2004 where we finished second for the first time in six years by 0.1 of a second. Yes. And, you know, he was a guy who lifted that relay team. And, you know, he's got the gold medal and I've got the silver medal to, to that race. And <laughs> I remember one time, this was back in 2017 when I was staying with him for for quite some time we were just out talking at midnight and he just walks out you know with that medal around his neck just to give it to me and i'm like you know that actually upsets me (laughs) he doesn't just say anything because he knows that you know No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. He's just smiling. He's just walking around smiling. He won't say a word. So he goes, and then, funny obviously, let, let me take a photo of that because I just need to remember it whenever I, I need to feel motivated. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to be able to, you know, have these great rivalries, but, you know, around to develop great friendships where you have this mutual respect for one another and, and you learn from one another. Yeah. Like, we we learned a lot when we trained to, together from one another to, to continue to increase our performance. And, and, again, it comes back to, you know, not only learning from coaches or mentors you, you, you're learning from peers all the time and, and that was the one thing being around someone with that sort of personality and ability mm. to be able to perform is yes. has taught me so much and surround yourself with like-minded people yes. you know that idea yeah, of having community correct. so look Pre- in, in gen life i wanted to ask you about where you are now you know being the the um you know general manager there um so uh, here you were coaching and, and mentoring people from a sports point of view. Now you're, you, you know, you're doing it in a, in a company uh, and doing it from a financial point of view. So tell us, how, how was that transition for you and um, have you been enjoying you know, the work in the financial planning or the, you know, the, that industry? Yeah, no, it's, it's it's funny. It's one of those things where I was just as interested in finance as I was swimming. So, you yeah. know, I was trading back as a teenager in, in shares and stocks and always interested in, in, you know, sort of deals like the investment banking side and commerce. And, you know, for me, I, I just had a real sort of thirst and appetite to understand and learn the industry. So, yeah, to, to be in a position now where, you know, running a, a, a listed company and, you know, we've had a lot of great success is, is something I'm very grateful to, to be able to do. But like anything, it took, you know, some time to get there. Uh, learning sort of, you know, what, what what are the products that we need to have that are best in market? How do we engage with the financial advice network that, you know, we receive a lot of our inflows from, developing the right team in that space. So mm. for me, it's just, it's hugely rewarding and satisfying. And, you know, very simple. I, I go back to the same principles as, um, in sport, like, what are our goals? What are yeah. the things we're achieving that no one else is doing? How are we dis- disrupting in different product categories? Mm. Um, and just getting people on board with that. And it's been funny being a part of this business now for over five 
five years. When I first came, there was, there was a sense of belief that we were doing some good things. But now when you walk out on the floor here, there's a sense of belief that we're going to do something new. We're going to do something exciting, engaging, always looking at ways to be able to engage our customers and clients and financial advisors to get feedback from them to improve everything we're doing and challenging ourselves all the time and you know it, the, the standard's always been set and it's not just by me anymore there's there's so many people out there that are just going you know we need to go here or do this you know i just went through a presentation that i'm doing next week with the marketing team and they've just re-engineered the way we present stuff because we want right. to make sure we stand out we just don't want to be a powerpoint presentation yeah. anymore and that that to me excites me so again it's like i came in tried to inject some of the things i knew and that's that's now coming back from people that are doing things that um they've got you know, full confidence and license to be able to achieve and that they probably, you know, a few years didn't think they could do. So for me, again, it just comes back to the people aspect of business. I love seeing people achieve. I love yeah. achieving that success yeah. with them. And, and at Gen Life, we've had plenty of that. We've gone from our, I guess, our sort of flagship product, which is an investment bond from 15% market share to the latest data, we now take 54% market share and it's, yeah. a, it's a growing space. So yeah. yeah, we've got a lot to be proud of, but I still get this, um, it's, uh, I call it you're, you're eternally dissatisfied. I always think, okay, we've reached this one goal. And I think that's what made me a, a good athlete was I could, yeah, I was never really happy. Like I won a world championship and I was like a week later, I'd sit there with my mom and I'd say kind of over it. Like I want to do the next thing now. And, <laughs> and, and I think that's the way you have that sustained success as well. And plus I also think, you can be humbled really quickly. Once you're in a truly competitive environment yeah. with so many variables you can't control, you've got to be sitting there going, what can go wrong? What can we be protecting ourselves against? What can we be doing better? Because I always find if a little bit of hubris or arrogance comes into something, it puts the blinkers on the face yep. and you miss things. You yes, start yeah, to totally. miss things and things can go wrong really quickly. So, you know, and, I, and I've learned those things the, the, the hard way through, whether it's sport and, and some elements of business as well. And so I think the older I get, the more I sit here and I go, Okay, we've been really successful, but what can go wrong now? <laughs> you know, it almost turns into that conversation very quick in, in, in my mindset. Yeah. Well, look, you, you brought up investment bonds and um, for our listeners and, and our viewers, they might not be aware, you, you're like one of the leading experts in Australia on investment bonds. And as you mentioned with Gen Life now, you know, with, with quite a large market share. But I think yeah. there's a lot of misunderstanding of what an investment bond is out there. Do you want to just explain, you know, briefly what, what is an investment bond and how can someone use it? Yeah, the, the 101 ex explanation for an investment bond is, is pretty straightforward. So, you know, when you're looking at investing, we all invest through different structures, whether we yeah. do it through our own personal name, through superannuation, through a trust or through yeah. a company. An investment bond bond is just that. It's just another legal structure that you invest through. And there's certain, um, I guess, nuances that come with that. One is a maximum tax rate of, of 30%. Usually effective tax rates sit in the teens for a lot of our investment options. Um, it's governed by the Life Act. So you have binding nominations. So great from an estate planning point of view, if you've mm. got your investment held through an investment bond and, and set it up correctly, it'll go to a beneficiary and you've got 100% reassurance that they will receive those funds. It won't go through your will or through your estate. Um, some other aspects, so tax-free transfers. Um, so there's, you know, just like any other legal structure, you make it part of your overall holistic um, approach towards investing. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the reason these have come back into fashion really was because of the changes to superannuation back in 2017. So super was the ultimate, you know, tax arbitrage. Mm -hmm. um, however, we all know it lacks liquidity. You can only access it at preservation age. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to an investment bond, you've got full liquidity. You've got a tax arbitrage. Whilst not as good as super, it's uncapped. And that's mm -hmm. where the changes to super about being capped around total, you know, cap balances or um, non-concessional concessional caps um, that came into play really made investment bonds popular again. They were very popular through the 80s, yeah. but I guess that's kind of, um, you know, the, the wheel has done a full turn and now they're back in popular fashion. But again, they're just not mainstream. And we, we do most of our distribution through financial advisors, not through the direct market, because yeah. financial advisors are more sophisticated. They understand the product. They understand where it fits into the overall structure, you know, whether that's estate planning, tax arbitrage, um, credit protection. Um, it's another big thing that comes with the, the bond structure, Section 1162 d of the Bankruptcy Act. If you want to fall asleep, <laughs> go have a read of that. Um, but again, it's so very, very safe, flexible um, structure that's been around for a long time. So, yeah, we really just reinvigorated the space and, and innovated quite a bit and then did a lot more marketing and education. And, yeah, it's, it's really taken off. When I came in here five years ago, we'd do, you know, just over $100 million worth of inflows in a year. We now do that basically in 10, 10 weeks or less. Okay, wow. Mm. Yeah.
Yeah, um, as a financial advisor myself, I mean, I, I love the way that you've just rolled off the legislation piece off the tongue like there's nothing. Um, and the t- I've been doing this for a long time now with investment bonds, trust me. Um, I've recently had experience, and you've touched on the estate planning side of things. Um, I had a, a client who was in her 80s and sold some property and had, had reasonable funds, but she didn't want her grandkids to benefit straight away. So we've set up yeah. a, a um, investment bond for yeah. her um, so that it was left automatically to the kids. And if they yep. pass it on to the grandkids, which she didn't like, that was up to up to them at the time. Um, and I yeah. always go back to the the saying when I'm talking to my clients: where there's a will, there's a relative, because someone will <laughs> always want to go and get something out of your estate. And, and, and the more in the will, the more relatives you tend to oh, have as well. So, yes. yeah, it's it's quite funny. Of the 639 million of, of business that we wrote last year in FY22, mm. um, 55% of that, the primary use, and this was a, a surprise to me, was actually around estate planning. I always thought complementary to super, alternative to, to super. You've got the liquidity mm. there. You know, you, you, you're paying better tax rates than a bucket company for a lot of our investments, or particularly in your own personal name for most people on a higher MTR. Mm. Um, but you know, it's it's around that exact reason, the, the fact that people want to make sure that it's going to go to that beneficiary. We we have a thing called a future event facility, which can control how and when. So if you're yeah. a grandparent, you're leaving to a ten year old. You don't want ten year olds to have access to two hundred fifty thousand no. dollars. But when they're twenty one, you're pretty happy for them to have access. And even then, you might say I only want them to access ten percent of that amount per year for a, a decade, and yeah. then you lift those yeah. restrictions. So yeah. really, through our structure now, you can cut it any which way you want to to have an estate planning outcome. And it's actually, I think, it's really nice for financial advisors the fact that they can take. I guess their advice piece to the next level. Um, I just came back from the States where I, I went to a lot of advice practices from, you know, some of the bigger shops to more the, the independents as well. And, you know, a lot of them do a lot of the tax planning, a lot of the estate planning and do a lot of the, the briefing to the estate planning lawyer or to the accountant on what they want to achieve, which I feel like we're kind of probably, I don't know, five or 10 years behind that in the industry year. But I think it's a great opportunity, particularly through the investment bond structure yeah. Yeah. for, you know, I guess advisors to deepen that relationship relationships, you know, help drive more revenue for their business, but most importantly, deliver an awesome outcome for their clients. Mm. And on the other end of that scale, obviously, we, you know, with Help My Wealth, we're dealing with clients that are, you know, probably starting out their journey um, in savings and mm. investing and so forth. And it, mm. it, it's a great tool um, for that type of purpose as well. You, you've hit the, the nail on the head there, Matt, because the, the reason we actually, we rebranded the business um, five years ago and we called it Generation Life and Generation Development Group, which is the, the listed entity, yeah. because there is a solution for each generation. And yes. that's exactly right. From from cradle to grave, you can have it for estate planning purposes or a lot of people, particularly, you know, parents or grandparents, uh, you know, could have been on you know, high marginal tax rates or, you know, quite, quite wealthy and, you know, obviously paying a fair bit in tax, but it's a really tax effective way to be able to save for your child's education. I know for my my two-year-old Eddie, I've got an investment bond set up for him that yeah. I just add $500 to each month yep. and that's going to pay for his private school fees, secondary, rather than me doing it from pay as you go out of my wage, which is twice as expensive from a tax point of view, um, rather than doing it through the investment bond. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people would do it for, for things like that or just you know, not even just private school fees, but perhaps a first car, home deposit, all the way through to a tax arbitrage while you're in the middle of your working um, life and it's a great liquid investment mm. through to making sure that you've got something for estate planning. So there is multiple strategies and purposes for the product, which is what I love about it because we, we're always kind of helping someone out achieve a goal, which is which is an awesome feeling as a business. And look, the flexibility of it is something that I find to be impressive. I mean, you know, if I want to, uh, say, put money away and say, you know, say I'm a grandparent, Parent and I'm like, right, I want my grandchild to be able to have this much money when they turn 18 for a car, then I want them to have this much money when they when they get to 25 for a house deposit, and then I want to have, you know, you can set that up, and whether I, yeah. I die tomorrow or whether I'm still alive when, when that happens, it, yeah. it's ready to go. Yep. But if something changes in, in my financial situation, I can turn around and go, actually, I'm going to pull that money out. Do you know what I mean? You that's can. that's yeah. not going to be the situation now. That ten years ago, that was my plan, but that's not my plan now. I actually need to use that money myself, or I want to, you know, my child to be able, or my grandchild, be able to use that now. And so you have this yeah. ultimate flexibility. I mean, you know, can you talk a little bit about though the difference between, say, um, obviously the, the the best way is to leave it in for ten years. That gives you the yeah. best tax benefits, but you can yeah. pull it out at any point. You can pull that out one year, two years, three years. But how does that change in regards to to the tax liability for you? 
That's right. Like, uh, you know, all of our investment structures, whether it's a company through to super, there's always these sort of nuances within the legislation um, that provide, you know, benefits at, at different points in time. So for us inside 10 years, um, if you were to pull out, say, a partial with, with withdrawal, still a great tax arbitrage, you've been paying a lower tax rate inside the investment. So you've got the compounding effect of that. Um, one of the great things, if you've been paying, say, an internal rate in one of our investment options of, say, 12 or 13%, which a lot of our options have an effective tax rate of, of that. On the assessable amount that comes out inside 10 years, you always receive a full 30% tax offset. So even if you've been paying a lower tax rate, you've got a 30% tax offset. So if you're on a higher marginal tax rate, you'll pay the difference between that and your marginal tax rate. If you're lower, you've probably got something to offset against some other income and and pay less in your overall tax liability with all your other forms of revenue that you might have coming in, such as your job or perhaps another investment. So um, inside 10 years, Great tax arbitrage. However, the benefits are maximised from 10 years onwards, yes. where regardless of if you take it a partial withdrawal or a full amount and whether it's a, a dollar to you know $10 million, there is nothing to declare to the ATO. So there's no personal tax liability. So once you're in that sweet spot, it's um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's money for jam. In fact, we have a lot of people that really get to 10 years and they keep adding to, to their investment bond because they know they're in this tax paid status. Yes. Um, yes. So for them, they're, they're just, you know, sort of, uh, you know, maximising their investment, getting a great compounding return, and they know they can access that at any point in time and there's nothing to declare from the ATO point of, point of view. And I think it's important to note there that that's both for yourself and for the person, you know, in the estate planning. So if you leave it to your grandchild, they're not paying tax on it. They're not getting $10,000 or 50000 and then paying tax on that yeah. as, as their income. That tax has been done, it's been paid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of the great things about this structure, and again, around the estate planning um, element, is that it doesn't matter whether it goes to a dependent or a non-dependent or someone outside of the family or yep. even a charity, an investment bond, when it's passed along upon death, is 100% tax-free. Yes. There is no tax liability. You literally give us a copy of the death certificate. If you're the beneficiary, as soon as we get that money from the fund manager or your chosen investment, which is just usually a few days, it'll be then back in your bank account. So yes. it's quite remarkable. And and Stephen, you touched on a really good point before, though. there's so much flexibility in terms of, you can change the terms of the vesting, you know, for estate planning purposes yeah. if you want to, you do that for free. We don't charge anything extra to do anything like that, unlike if you're changing around trust, trust structures, whether it's a discretionary yes. or a testamentary trust. We know there's a lot of expense associated with those structures, particularly in setting them up. However, one of the things I love, if you buy an investment property right, you've held it for, I don't know, seven or eight years, you've almost doubled in value, you go put 600,000 in, it's worth a million bucks. You go, oh, I wish I had it in that entity over here, that would be a bit smarter. You know you can't transfer it. As soon as you transfer to a different legal owner or a different structure because EGT liability and you could have stamp duty on the other side. That doesn't happen with an investment bond. If I had an investment bond that grew from 600,000 to a million, I could transfer it to over to yourself, Stephen, or to to Matt or to anyone else in my family. (laughs) No, no tax liability is triggered as can you please? Can you? Um, you know, no tax liability is triggered. I wasn't expecting it, but yeah, yeah, I'll take it. It's been a nice conversation, but it just got a whole heap better. (laughs) (laughs) But it's quite remarkable. You can transfer it around to different owners for different purposes at any point in time. The benefits that you've got, you know, pre-10 years, post-10 years, does not matter. All stay 100% the same and the face value and yeah. that stays the same too. So, yeah, yeah, the flexibility is quite remarkable. And you've got a, a large number of investment choices as well compared to something like an industry fund Absolutely. where you've only got a handful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so when you look at our investment menu, and we're expanding all the time. We just came out with a couple of model portfolios with Morningstar um, just last week on, on Friday. So, you know, we've got you know 64 investment options that sit on the menu. We cover all the asset classes. So, regardless of what your risk profile is or your preference around investing, whether it's diversified, core satellite, yeah. or you know you want to go single sector funds and sort of you know have different weightings, you can do anything like that. So you've and got the choice. Where, yeah. You can change it at any point yeah. in time. Um, where investment agnostic at Generation Life. So we're not worried about what investment you put it in. There's nothing in it for us. We yes. just put an investment menu that we see great tax arbitrage in those investments um, and that there's demand from the market for them. And, and that, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Look, um, one of the things I, I think is important to, to point out is that let's say you start off and, and you put, um, we'll make it nice and easy, $1,000 into 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 a bond. Uh, we've yeah. talked about it now that, you know, you get to 10 years and that's going to be the, the best tax advantage. But as you add money to it, what are the rules around adding money to that investment bond as it heads towards that 10-year mark? 
Yeah, so one of the things you could imagine, um, as soon as you put a dollar in, mm. the clock starts ticking on that 10 years. Yeah. So, per me, what they have in place is a thing called a 125% rule, or we call it the 125% opportunity, where if you've put in, say, $10,000 in the first year, the next year you can put in 125% of that, which is, of course, $12,500. Mm. And you can either put in a percent of that or up to 125%. So it do doesn't matter. You can pick mm. a choose. That's why we have a lot of people, including myself, that have saving plans attached to their bonds. So, you know, they just put in a bit each month, so they've got that opportunity every single year. What this achieves, one or two, two things. One is it it stops people from putting that dollar in, then putting in $10 million yeah. at 9.9 .9 years and being in this sort of tax paid status with nothing to declare to the ATO. Um, but at the same time, it also, you know, if you've stopped adding to that bond, you can't put any more money into that bond because 125% of zero from that year yeah. mm -hmm. is obviously zero. So, you know, it encourages people to save at the same time to keep adding to it. But in the scenario where you haven't added to it, but you still want to add to a bond, you can have as many investment bonds as you like. We have yes. some very well families that you know some some have you know well over 10 grandchildren and they've got one set up for every single grandchild yeah. um, with all the different vesting periods and different conditions attached to them um, given you know the relationship or what age that that grandchild's at so yeah it's, it's really dynamic in terms of what you can do but yeah it, it's almost uh, I find it's an almost an enforced savings discipline that 125 percent rule yeah so it's really about the, the structure and the discipline behind savings if you don't yeah. save well then you're not going to get there Mm. Yeah, yeah you, and, and you're not going to get the maximum opportunity out of the product structure that you could. So, yeah, that's that's why I think our savings plan, which is is hugely popular, that people that start off with smaller bonds of five or ten thousand dollars often have you know a couple hundred dollars in a savings plan attached to it each month just to keep adding to it. Yeah. And it, and it's a great discipline for the individual, right? Because whenever you've got something that's direct debiting out of your account, it's like money that you haven't earned. Yeah. it's just yeah, kind it's of just like there. disappeared. So mm -hmm. it's this it's instant discipline in place where if you look at, oh, I've got a couple hundred dollars in the bank account. Oh, I might buy that, you know, shirt or pair of pants that I was looking Hopefully at. So, sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Oof, it was a big nine months, but yeah, no, ab 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 absolutely. So you've, you know, just got those little disciplines and frameworks in place. So I think that's a great part of the legislation that helps support people in saving for their future. Yes, yeah, so and the money fairies take care of it for you. Yeah, money fairies. Yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> and look, one yeah. of the things I love about Generation Life when I was, you know, looking into it and, and, and reading about yourself and, and the company company when you will come in on the podcast is that you know you guys are very much about wanting to get the right people in with the right products so you know you yeah. spend time with the financial advisors to say is this going to be right for this person so in your situation where you had that lady come in looking at the estate planning mm. you're able to go to generation life and go look here's my situation or here's my client situation i'm thinking this is the right way to go yes uh, what do you think you know and, yeah. and it's great that you guys actually aren't that sort of company that are there to go no no yeah. Investor bonds are for everyone. Do you know, there isn't a no. person in the world that shouldn't be no, having one, yes. you know. Um, and, I, and I love that yeah, about yeah. the company. You're I love killing yourself if you don't have an investment bond. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's one of those things that it, it's a big, it's part of our value set actually here yeah. is, is integrity. Yeah. So there's, there's no good us saying one of our values is integrity. Then we go out and then we do a deal where we think that person was probably better off directing and, you know, direct investing into that particular asset versus yeah. going through our structure. So, you know, we, we have a lot of people, particularly on a estate planning side that are pulling money out of super super and there's a taxable component in super upon death for a lot of people so we'll do the analysis for the financial advisor and for the client to go okay if you pull that money out this is what it looks like in the investment bond this is what it'll look like upon super you know this is a crossover point of break even or whatever it might be with that particular structure which can be quite complex sometimes yeah. sometimes it can be very straightforward we can have an advisor just jump online look at our comparison calculator and go yep you know what instead of going to that managed fund directly or going through you know the investment bond structure at Gen Life, I'm much better off at doing that. So you know we've got a technical team, we've got product teams here that that help all of that that sort of stuff out, and even our business development managers do a lot for our, for our advisors as well. So mm. yeah, we want to make sure if the deal works, it works. If it if it clearly doesn't, then we'll be very cl clear about that as well. We want to make sure that the the strategy is 100% aligned to the goal, and if it's not, then then we don't want to do it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, we've really appreciated you coming in and, and talking about finance and, and talking to us particularly about investment bonds. It's just great to get that sort of information from, you know, 
a professional who knows what they're talking about. Yep. It's much better than you and I just chatting about something like that. Absolutely, get distracted. <laughs> and get distracted. No, by, you know, appreciate appreciate you guys taking the time to, to have a chat. It's funny, yeah. probably people see me on this podcast. I start talking about investment bonds, and I look more excited than I do about the Olympics. But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's weird. It's it's one of those products where I, over time I, I've absolutely fallen in love with because mm. we've seen it be able to you know some really complex problems, particularly yeah. with estate planning with people with even you know disabilities or certain issues and we've been able to help solve that so it's been really nice to to help people meet their their financial goals in in some sort of way so yeah no it's been super satisfying so yeah thanks for the opportunity to have a chat about it no problems well look we we like to ask um, a lot of our guests to come along uh to wrap up if you could go back and talk to your 17 18 year old self what sort of advice would you give them it's always a good question. And, uh, you know, if, if I could give my, my younger self some advice would be one, um, you know, clear, clear boundaries, yeah. uh, I think would be really, really important because I felt like I had a life as a 17 year old where I was being poked and prodded and pulled from one direction to the other because yeah. I, was a, I was a world champion athlete at the time and a young kid going to high school. So that was a bit full on. Um, and the other element would be just surround yourself by the right people. Um, yeah. you know, a, along that journey, it's, it's really interesting. Some of the people who come across, some are great, some, some are not so great. And you sort of work that out along the way, but yeah, it's, it's a really, uh, interesting path I was going through as a 17 year old but I think those boundaries and being surrounded by the right I guess set of people was was super important and get that right would put me in good stead yeah yeah fantastic fantastic and another question if you were going to write a book which I'm sure you've been approached many times for what would the title be for you uh, the, the title would be, I mean, the first thing that pops into my mind when I, I hear that that question is not finished because mm. yeah. you're right, I, I have been asked on quite a few occasions over the years to, to write a book and every time someone asks me that question or wants to do it, I always – sit there and I think, well, I'm not finished. The story's not <laughs> finished yet. Like I've still got so much more I feel like I can, uh, you know, achieve for myself and, and and I can participate in and do. So, you know, I'll probably feel like that when I'm 80 as well, but um, yeah, <laughs> maybe one day. So I'm sure when I write it, that'll end up being the title because I feel like, okay, maybe it's a good enough point to reflect on a few things, but there's still going to be some stuff to come. <laughs> I'll, I'll be looking forward to reading the not finished book, uh, you know, when you turn 85 and you yeah, write the not finished book. will chapter 12 and there'll be nothing there. <laughs> yet so i'll be like it'll be, it'll be coming we can have a, a really australian term where i can hack it yeah yeah exactly Still that would it. be that would be actually it's probably not a bad one it's probably good for the marketing side of it anyway i was going to say i'm sure there's marketers out there right now going that's exactly yeah. what i wanted to do yeah, yeah that's we good yeah we can it. use that <laughs> well look we really appreciate your time thank you so much for coming on and for sharing with us and um yeah it's, it's been really great so we appreciate it no worries. Thanks for the time and thanks for the chat. Thanks, Matt. No Good problems. to see you. And Matt, thank you also for joining us this week. Thanks, Dave. No problems. It's been a pleasure. Look, Help My Wealth is all about empowering our, your financial journey. And today we've done that by talking to Grant Hackett and talking about investment bonds. I hope that's been helpful for you. Please uh, go to our website if you want to know more information and if you want to know more about Help My Wealth and to be able to learn about mentoring that we do and also the um, literacy programs around finances. So thank you and have a good week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. information discussed by the Help My Wealth and the Money Rules, Money Rules podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only and is generally nature and it is not advice. It is not intended as a substitute for professional finance, legal or tax advice. It is aimed to provide a general understanding of each topic and should not be relied upon to make an investment or financial decision. It is strongly suggested that you seek professional advice regarding your own individual circumstances before making a financial decision. Help My Wealth and the hosts of the Money Rules and Money Rules podcast are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and, if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. Do not take financial advice from a podcast. In the spirit of reconciliation, Help My Wealth and the Money Rules or Money Rules podcast acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to past, present and emerging elders. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today.